Top Gear drifted around 36 consecutive corners and onto your Super NES back in 1992. Developed by Gremlin Graphics and published by Kemco, Top Gear was one of the very first racing games to hit the Super NES back when it was originally released. And no, before you even start to ask, this game has nothing to do with the television show of the same name. Top Gear the game, though, is essentially in the same style of popular arcade racers at the time, like OutRun, and it's all about super fast speeds with very little braking involved. So does Top Gear succeed in bringing home the excitement of arcade racing games to the Super NES, or is it stuck in second gear with no hope of finishing? Well, strap into your favorite off-brand sports car, because we're about to see if Top Gear can make it to the pole position. Start up Top Gear and you get a fairly large amount of options to play with before you ever even get into a race. Things like choosing your driver's name, manual or automatic transmissions, and even several different control setups that barely make any sense. Like this one, I mean, who's really playing with their controller upside down? You of course also get the option of selecting your car, each with their own strengths and weaknesses. Generally they all have a give and take with performance and speed, though Top Gear also includes their overall fuel consumption during a race as well, which we'll get into here in a bit. So choose whichever car fits your driving style best, and then get ready to burn some pixelated rubber tires. Once out on the track, the first thing you'll probably notice is the weird screen setup. No, you didn't accidentally pick the two-player option. That screen's always there regardless of what you choose. It may be a bit distracting at first, but you eventually learn to ignore it, and fortunately doesn't ever cover up anything that a full-screen view would have shown more of. Other than that, Top Gear is your standard arcade racing game, complete with tons of cars to pass, obstacles scattered all over the track, and a complete lack of anything approaching a simulation. As mentioned before, if you're using the brake, then you're doing it wrong. Top Gear requires no such advanced driving techniques here, and is generally fine with looking more like bumper cars than actual racing. Your main strategy is to go fast, and if that isn't working, then go faster using the limited number of turbo boosts you get before every race. Avoid and pass enough cars and you shouldn't have too much of a problem making it into the top three regularly. So if you're coming into Top Gear expecting things like braking lines and optimal car customization, then you better find another racing game to play. One area where Top Gear differs from its arcade brethren is in its race length. While Top Gear starts off fast and furious with some quick three lap races, it quickly changes gear as you're doing six and even seven lap races that can take well over five minutes to finish. And it's not trying to be long just for the sake of extending the game either, since this is where the whole fuel consumption from the car select screen comes into play. Yes, Top Gear was one of the very first racing games to actually make you manage your fuel for longer races. If you see you're getting low, you can jam into any available pit stop to refuel. The cool thing about all this is just how much stress strategy is actually involved in refueling. Just like real racing, you can gamble on a low tank in hopes of getting to the finish without pitting. But if you're wrong, then you'll be stranded on the side of the track in last place. You can also leave the pit at any time during a pit stop, so you can either go in for a full tank if you've got the time, or speed off with a splash of fuel if you're in a hurry. It's really neat that this is even in the game at all, and adds a ton of strategy to what would otherwise be a super simple arcade racer. Now you would think with Top Gear being an early Super NES racer that it would have a ton of problems with it, right? Amazingly enough though, Gremlin Graphics have produced a near flawless game here. If you're worried about game length due to it being an arcade style racing game, then don't be. Top Gear has a substantial amount of tracks and locations to race in, and even has a good variety of stuff you'll see in them. Each location is filled with unique obstacles and roadways, which goes a long way in making those longer races more than just constant passing on a boring course you've already seen a dozen times. About the only bad thing I can say about the game is that it's just not as smooth as other racing games that came out after it, hurting the overall sense of speed. The scrolling isn't bad for the most part, but there are times when it can definitely drop down into choppy territory, making some of the faster courses feel like a slideshow at times. Besides that though, I've got no real complaints with the game at all. 
If you haven't guessed by now, I really like Top Gear. It's easily my favorite racing game on the Super NES. Yes, better games did eventually come out, but Top Gear has a certain fun simplicity to it that few racing games on the Super NES could ever duplicate. I was actually never even a fan of racing games at all until I played Top Gear, so that's gotta say something about just how much fun it is. And it's even better when you finally do get a second player to use on that bottom screen since you can now team up to take down the rest of the pack together. And to top it off, Top Gear is still just as fun to play today as it was then. So if you're looking for a great Super NES racer, then Top Gear should be at the top of your list, and is in my opinion a first place finish when compared to every other racing game on the system. Abidox landed on the NES with that gross sound that raw meat makes when it hits the floor back in 1990. While shooters on the NES were a dime a dozen back then, Abidox was unique in that it was one of the only shooters at the time that tried to merge the standard shoot 'em up gameplay of other shooters with a more horror-like sci-fi setting. The advertising for the game was in full-on gross-out mode, and was at the very least corny enough to get noticed. A monster devours your planet in Abidox for Nintendo! Do you have the guts to battle inside the belly of the beast? Fight ugly eyeballs, twisted worms, skeleton fish, guardian ghouls, and save the planet from total destruction! Abidox for your Nintendo! So did Abidox offer up its own unique take on the genre? Or was it yet another generic NES shoot 'em up that we'd all played at least a few dozen times already? Well, put on your favorite exosuit because we're about to go head first into Abidox. In a world where most NES storylines barely attempt to explain why or what you're doing in any given game, Abidox at least had one hell of a setup. Essentially, you come back to your home planet after hunting the galaxy for pixely aliens, only to find that your entire planet has been eaten by a massive alien. Of course, the only reaction you can have to seeing such a thing is to turn around and get the fuck out of there as fast as possible. <laughs> wait, wait, no, I forgot, this is an NES game. What actually happens is that you decide to fly inside this planet-sized alien by yourself, kill hundreds of enemies, and ultimately save your planet. That's the plot of Abidox. <laughs> God bless you video games. Once you're actually down on the planet, the game begins in earnest, and what you get is a pretty standard shoot 'em up game. Or if you're super cool, a shmup. You fly around as this little guy in a spacesuit, shooting at whatever decides to fly in from the right side of the screen at you. You start off with what equates to the space version of a pea shooter to vanquish the never-ending stream of alien hemorrhoids coming at you. To help you along, you'll of course find power-ups that include such things as speed boosts, better weapons, and spinny orb things that absorb incoming bullets. If this all sounds familiar to you, then you'd probably be right, as this should be deja vu if you've ever played a shmup in your life. Abidox definitely isn't going for anything very original in the gameplay department that games like Life Force didn't already do way better years earlier. The only thing mildly original about the gameplay are the top-down scrolling levels that pop up now and again. It does at least inject some variety into the game that desperately needs it, but that's about it. Beyond that, this is as basic a shmup as you'll be able to find on the NES. What you do get in Abidox, however, is some really cool stage and enemy designs. As already mentioned, the entire game takes place inside one giant alien. So get used to pulsating meat walls, huge tumor-like obstacles, and a really neat variety of enemies and bosses. The cool fusion of alien grossness and what used to be your home planet makes for some fun stages to fly through, and goes a long way in setting Abidox apart from other shooters, at least in the graphics department. Sadly though, that's about all Abidox has going for it, unless you count the nigh on impossible difficulty level. Yes, Abidox is hard, really hard, and not so much because there's a ton of bullets coming at you. It's actually fairly easy to dodge the incoming bullets. No, the hardest thing about Abidox is just how unforgiving it is. Getting your ship powered up can make you feel almost invincible, tearing through enemies and bosses like warm butter. But make one mistake, and you're sent packing back to the beginning of the level, or a mid-boss checkpoint with only that pea shooter in tow. At this point, you may as well just restart the whole game, because it's basically impossible to get powered back up enough to continue on. And with every enemy in the game meticulously placed for maximum amounts of anger-induced testicle punching, you're going to have to memorize everything to get far at all. If all that sounds like a good time, then Abidox is, well, it's probably your game. The rest of us, though, will be over here laughing at your insanity. 
Amazingly enough though, the difficulty doesn't extend to the bosses themselves, as all of them are incredibly easy to the point where you can just sit in one spot and never move on several of them. The rest only require a bit of maneuvering here and there to beat. It only goes to show that the developers really only knew how to make the difficulty the shitty cheap way, rather than the skill-based difficulty of other better shooters. Still though, Abadox has a weird charm to it for me. It may be almost completely impossible while being the most generic playing shmup around, but it's still got a B-movie quality to it that I love. Yes, there are far better shooters on the NES out there to play, but it's worth checking out Abadox just for its ridiculous setting, and even more ridiculous enemies and bosses. Plus, there's not too many other games out there where you can say that you had to kill a giant alien turd to make it to the next stage. So give Abadox a try. You may end up liking, or at least laughing your way through one of the NES's more obscure shmups. Commando lobbed a grenade at your NES back in 1986 and is a mostly direct port of the arcade game by the same name. Commando in the arcades was incredibly popular at the time due to its fast-paced run-and-gun gameplay combined with spot-on controls. While the game was busy eating up quarters in the arcade, Capcom decided to port the game to the NES in the early days of the console's launch, trying to bring all of the action of the arcade game with it. So did Capcom manage to port over the impressive arcade game to the NES? Or was this an early example of a developer trying to do too much with the NES and tossing out a broken mess of a game? Well, grab your favorite oversized grenades, because we're about to completely raid Commando for the NES. Boot up Commando and you're met with a basic start screen, and not much else. No cool introduction cutscenes, story, or even an option screen. Like we've mentioned before in these early days of arcade to NES ports, Commando isn't offering up much of anything beyond what was already present in the arcade game. So you're getting just as straightforward an experience here that was in the arcade. You do at least get an alternating two-player bow to play with a friend. But if none are around, or you're some weird ostracized hermit like I was, just go ahead and press the start button to get tossed into the action. Once you're dropped off by your super cool chopper, you take control of this guy right here. His name's Super Joe, and his main mission is to run forward and shoot everyone and everything in his path to get to the end of each stage. To do this, you get a machine gun with unlimited ammo and eight different directions to shoot in with it. You also get a limited supply of grenades to chuck at the enemies that are just too darn smart to run straight at you. Each stage offers up a variety of obstacles beyond just spaztastic soldiers with things like vehicles that only exist to kamikaze themselves at you, edges to fall off of to your death below, and the occasional building to burn to the ground. Once you make it to the end of each stage, you're met with a commander and several soldiers to kill before you can run through the gate and onto the next stage. Do that a total of four times and you beat the game. If that sounds incredibly bare bones, well, it's because it is. Commando was, after all, the blueprint for every other top-down action game that came after it, so it's forgivable, since it was one of the first of its kind. Sadly, just the option of having a grenade to throw at the enemies was a nice extra when this game originally came out. So just how well does Commando stack up to its arcade big brother, though? Surprisingly, not too bad, to be honest, especially for just how early it was in the NES's life cycle when it first came out. This was actually Capcom's first in-house port of a game for the NES that wasn't licensed out to someone else, so it's even more impressive with just how well it turned out. Controlling your character and shooting is just as fun as it was in the arcade, and there's more than enough stuff on screen to shoot at at any given time. The graphics obviously took a hit in detail coming over to the NES, but it's still colorful and easy to make out everything on the screen. Capcom even added in one extra feature that wasn't in the arcade version, and that being the secret hidden dungeons that you can find around each stage. They're honestly not much at all, but it was cool that Capcom at least saw fit to include it into the game at all. Even with how good a port it was at the time, it still has more than a few issues that actually kind of make it hard to play these days. 
As mentioned before, this was Capcom's first chance to get a grip with the NES hardware, and it really shows. Most of the time, the game feels like it's just kind of broken, with rampant stuttering, and bad slowdown, and some of the worst flickering I've ever seen on the NES. Literally almost everything on the screen will be flickering at times, making it kind of hard to make out what's even happening. Enemy AI is also non-existent, producing some of the dumbest enemies in video game history here. Their main form of attack seems to be to run onto the screen in a random direction and occasionally shoot a bullet at you, most of the time not even paying attention to your character. It's so bad that most enemies are more easily ran past than shot at. Even weirder, enemies will just sometimes completely vanish off the screen for no reason. <laughs> it's really super distracting at times. Also, the length of the game is laughable, lasting a total of 10 minutes to get through the first playthrough if you know what you're doing at all. You do at least get a second playthrough that's a bit harder and longer, but it's still not enough to make the game push beyond 30 minutes total. While you can ultimately get used to the jankiness of the graphics, it's the game's length that, unfortunately, just can't be excused in the end. Problems aside, Commando for the NES is still a classic for the system. It may look like a mess at times, but it's still a great game. I personally remember this being one of the first NES games I ever purchased with my own money, and had a ton of fun with it over the years. I could actually still sit down with it these days and have just as good a time with it, at warts and all. Would I recommend it to someone else now if they've never played it? Well, definitely, but with a word of caution on what to expect. So give it a try. Commando for the NES is still one of the best early action games on the system, and was a hell of a jumping off point for every game that made the Commando formula even better on the NES after its release. Donkey Kong Country exploded out of a barrel of bananas and onto your Super NES back in 1994. Developed by Rare, Donkey Kong Country was a huge deal when it came out, mostly due to the attention the game's graphics were getting. Nintendo was hyping Donkey Kong Country through the roof all the way up to release, promising next-gen graphics and gameplay on the system you already own. So did it end up living up to the hype, or did the first game in the series fall flat? While I'm already sure most of you know the answer to that, let's just humor the guy reading this script for the moment and check out what Donkey Kong Country is all about. Start up Donkey Kong Country and one of the first things you'll notice are its graphics. Back then it was absolutely stunning, as the entirety of the game had been created and rendered on SGI computers and then transferred over to the Super NES. The result at the time was nothing less than spectacular. Just about every game on the Super NES up to that point featured fairly limited detail and animation. Donkey Kong Country changed all of that though, with huge, well-animated characters, awesome backgrounds, and some really great special effects not usually seen in a 16-bit game. It was so impressive that it was single-handedly responsible for starting the CG graphics trend that many 2D games would go on to have after its release. Admittedly, the graphics aren't anywhere near as amazing these days, and has an overly dark look to it sometimes. But for its time, Donkey Kong Country was almost revolutionary, and the graphics were one of the big reasons it sold so well. While those graphics may look like snot-covered sludge these days, the gameplay is still just as good as it was back on its release day. You play the game as Donkey Kong or his nephew Diddy Kong in a fairly standard 2D platformer that doesn't stray too far from the established Mario Bros. formula. You dispatch enemies by jumping on top of their heads, or by throwing barrels at them that you find lying around the levels. Donkey Kong is a bit heavier than Diddy, so he can't quite jump or run as fast, but has a ground pound move that can take out enemies at close range. Diddy, on the other hand, is more nimble, but can't kill some of the bigger enemies that Donkey Kong can. Personally, I always prefer Diddy, since he can move faster and jump further, but each character has their own strengths and weaknesses when it comes to getting around each level. Donkey Kong and Diddy do occasionally get help from their jungle friends though, as you'll find more than a few animals that you can play as to help you throughout the game. Hit the right boxes and levels and you'll suddenly find yourself rampaging through the stage on the back of a rhinoceros, or through watery caves hanging onto a swordfish, along with a few others that you'll find. The animal friends definitely added a bit of variety to the gameplay, and all of them play differently enough to make each one feel fun and unique when they show up. If there's one problem with them, it's that they don't come up enough throughout the game. 
It's unfortunate, but at least playing with Donkey Kong and Diddy is always fun enough, so when the animals do show up, it's just an added bonus. Mastering Donkey Kong and Diddy shouldn't take too long, which is a good thing since getting through each area of the island will test just about everything the duo can do several times over. The sheer variety in stages is one of the game's best qualities, usually mixing things up on a regular basis. One of the more unique gameplay elements included in the game are the barrels scattered around some levels. These things essentially act as a cannon that blasts you in the direction that the barrel's pointing. This seems fairly innocent at first, but gets absolutely insane later in the game as several levels are made up entirely of chaining together successful barrel blasts from one to the other. It can get pretty tricky, but was always fun to blast your way around stages. Less fun, however, were the minecart stages that come close to harkening back to the speeder bike stage in Battletoads. And while not nearly as hard as that hot mess of a stage was, the minecart in Donkey Kong Country can come close due to its super cheap obstacles that come at you far too fast. You also get some pretty fun underwater stages that are more maze-like, along with others that can feature large obstacles not seen in other stages. And for a game this long, it's really impressive just how often you're tasked with tackling a new situation that hasn't come up before. It really goes to show that Rare wasn't just relying on the cool CG graphics to carry the game, and put just as much care and thought into the stages themselves as they did the rest of the game. Unfortunately, Donkey Kong Country does have a few problems that are hard to ignore, no matter how much you may love the game. Those CG graphics might have had an initial wow factor to them, but they can quickly turn into an annoyance depending on what stage you're playing, especially the darker stages that can turn into a muddy, blurry mess and can make platforms and characters hard to see. The inertia of Donkey Kong and Diddy can also make the controls feel overly slippery, making you constantly overcorrect yourself since it feels like you're always about to slide off an edge. There can also be some issues with the hit detection here and there, and some minor slowdown can pop up in the worst spots, making things harder than it should. Even with the few issues it has though, it goes without saying that Donkey Kong Country was an instant classic. While those super neato graphics haven't aged well at all, it was still an amazing achievement for the time. Of course, Donkey Kong Country still lives on to this day with its latest game being on the Wii U at the time of this video. And if anything, it continues to get better and better with each new game. Unlike Mario, Donkey Kong has mostly stuck with his tried-and-true 2D-style platforming and has honed it to near perfection over the years. So while just about any Donkey Kong Country game will give you a great time, it's the original game that still resonates the most with me. Nostalgia will unfortunately do that to you, I guess. Personally, I think the first game is still more than worth picking up and playing, though. There's some great stages and moments in here, and just like Cranky Kong, shouldn't be overlooked just because it's old.